I want to thank everybody for logging on to our webinar. We're excited to have Dorsey Botterford joining us today. I'm going to turn the presentation over to her in just a second. My name is Larissa Green with Advanta IRA. I'm an associate for education and marketing. I've been with Advanta for five years. Um, and I want to mention that Advanta IRA does not give any tax, legal, or investment advice. We're going to be talking today about what you can do with a solo K, and I'm also going to go over briefly the other types of accounts that can be self-directed. If you have any questions that um, may, may fall into those categories, ask them anyways, and if I can't answer them, we might be able to give you the names of some professionals who can help you with those. Um, as we go through the webinar, if you have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box. We're going to um, go ahead and let Dorsey start the presentation, and we have a couple designated spots where we're going to take questions, but go ahead and get them into the chat box, and we'll answer, the, answer them at that time. Um, I want to start by mentioning the different types of accounts that can be self-directed. The most types, common types of, of accounts are going to be traditional and Roth IRAs. Um, Employer-based accounts are SEP and simple IRAs. And of course, solo cases we'll be talking about today. Um, any old employer's plan can also be used to self-direct. What you would do essentially is just roll the employer's plan into an IRA with Advanta, and then you can choose the investments. If you are currently employed, you may be able to use that plan, but that would be a question for your plan administrator. I also have up here education savings accounts and health savings accounts. And although they are not IRAs, the rules for self-directing those accounts are the same, and so we can help you with those. Um, up here I also have some examples of different types of investments we see our clients make with self-directed IRAs. And I know Dorsey is going to be going over a specific example, but I just wanted to give you, um, of course, not the complete list, but kind of an idea of what we're seeing. Um, rentals, of course, and, and that can be rentals in any capacity. It could be uh, single-family homes or duplexes, condos, fix and flips. There are no rules with a self-directed IRA that say you have to hold an investment for a certain amount of time. So if you want to purchase a property, rehab it, and turn around and sell it for a profit, you can do that. Mortgage notes. Um, of course, if, you're, if you don't really want to be involved in the work that a rental might um, come up, bring up, then you might want to be invested in something like a mortgage note, um, tax liens, option contracts, assignments, accounts receivable, all of those are permissible in a self-directed IRA. I also have on the list precious metals, and we're talking um, here about the tangible gold and silver bars, foreign currency trading or Forex accounts, oil and gas, and another um, less common investment we've seen is equipment leasing. Um, I want to go ahead and turn the seminar over now to Dorsey Botiford. Again, if you have questions for Dorsey, go ahead and type them into the chat box, and we'll be getting to those shortly. Dorsey? Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me on, Larissa. I'm excited to talk about solo 401ks. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm an investor in Atlanta, and um, I invest in real estate full-time. Um, but in setting up my retirement accounts, I looked into the solo 401k, and there's a lot of new tax law that really makes this a very, um, very attractive way to invest for your retirement. And so I want to talk a little bit about that today, and then later on I want to show you an example of how I have been growing my solo 401k account with just very little dollars. So. Um, first of all, what is a solo 401k? Well, you might you know about a 401k, just your standard 401k, but recently there have been um, new advantages allowed for the 401k for those of us who are self-employed. So um, you might have heard of it as a single 401k, individual 401k, self-employed 401k, one participant 401k. These are all the, the solo 401k. Those are just different nicknames. Um, so who can have a solo 401k? A good slide. The solo 401k, uh, you must own your own business. And um, then you must have some type of self-employed earned income, and that's going to be active income. Um, and you must have no employees other than yourself and or spouse. And now there are a few exceptions here. You could have employees under the age of 21. Um, you could have a part-time employee or someone who's working less than 1,000 hours per year. Um, or union employees or non-resident alien employees. 
So if you fall under um, these qualifications, then you can set up a SOLA 401k account. So, so why would you even look at a SOLA 401k? Well, some of the advantages that I like about the SOLA 401k is that you can make much higher contributions than you can in some other retirement accounts. So you can contribute a total of $53,000 into your SOLA 401k every year, and if you're age 50 or older, um, there's an extra contribution you can make that, that makes it 59000 So you yourself personally can contribute up to $18,000 or $24,000 if you're age 50 or older into that account every year, and then your company can contribute 20 to 25% of your profit into that account as well. Um, now, the 20, 25% is going to depend on what type of business you have, what type of company, um, but that's typically the rule of thumb there. Now, you can be a sole proprietorship, you could be an LLC, an S corporation, a C corporation. Um, it doesn't quite matter how you set up your business. Um, you can, you, if it, at the qualifications we talked about, if you qualify, you can have a sole for 1K. So another advantage of a 401k, um, like with an IRA, is a 401k, you can have a Roth component. Now this, uh, and then slide, yeah. So here's a diagram showing um, just the different ways you can contribute into your 401k plan. So within your plan, you can have a traditional component where you can contribute and your company can contribute before tax dollars into your SOLA 401k account where the investments can grow tax deferred. So you're going to be taxed on the distribution. Now, you can also set up a Roth component of that same SOLA 401k account. So it's, it's not a separate account necessarily. It's within the SOLA 401k. There's that Roth component where you yourself can make an employee deferral into the account and that's going to be after tax um, investment in there, and it will grow tax free. So when you're ready to distribute out from your SOLA 401k, there'll be no tax due. So there's a lot of benefits with contributing to the traditional or the Roth. It really depends on what you see as being your tax um, status and all for, for now and then also for the future. Now there's there are ways that you can uh, you can contribute into the traditional component, and then that can be converted into the Roth, and, and taxes are paid at that time. Um, but there's those two components that you can have. They can be separate accounts, um, separate bank accounts, or you can have them um, be together. You just need to make sure that you um, keep those funds recorded and you know which are the traditional funds and which are the Roth funds. Okay. So another, uh, another advantage of the SOLA 401k is that there is no income restriction. You can contribute to your SOLA 401k no matter what your income is for that year. Um, or you might decide not to contribute to your SOLA 401k for that year. You don't have to contribute every single year. Um, but like with Roth IRAs, you're, you're capped at a certain income before you can, um, you can't contribute after a certain income level. But with the Roth, there is, that limitation is not there. Um, also, with the SOLA 401k, you can have that in addition to any IRA that you might have. So go ahead and set up your IRA. If you already have an IRA, you can, you can set up a SOLA 401k. You can also have a 401k with an employer and then have your SOLA 401k on the side. So a cool thing about the SOLA 401k is that um, because it's those self-employed dollars that um, qualify you for the SOLA 401k, the this could be you know, self-employed income coming from a side business. Maybe you're consulting on the side. Uh, maybe you're investing real estate on the side. Um, so you can have your SOLA 401k in addition to other retirement accounts. Um, another couple of advantages I like is that you can be your own trustee. So you can go to your local bank. You can set up a trust account for your SOLA 401k, get a separate EIN number, get it all set up, and you, can, you, have, you have true checkbook control. I've got my SOLA 401k checkbook right here at my desk, and so when a deal comes along, I can fund that deal with SOLA 401k funds that day. There's no lag time. You can be aggressive in your investing because you have that full control. Um, and you don't need to, to direct a custodian as to what to do with your investments since you can be your own trustee of that account. 
Um, you can also be your own plan administrator, um, which means you do need to keep up with your record keeping and bookkeeping, but that could also mean less cost for that retirement account because you, you have the power to do all that yourself. Um, so those are two main parts of why I like the Slow 401 k um, and it has allowed me to make investments that I would not have been able to make with other retirement accounts because a lot of real estate investments, which is what I, I typically do with my Slow 401 k um, a lot of them are very time sensitive. So um, that just gives that account even more power to be able to invest. Um, and then also the Slow 401 k has less risk. Um, when you invest in investments, maybe with like an IRA or another retirement account, that whole account could be subject to, um, to the penalty if, if you have a prohibited transaction within there. So like an IRA, um, the Silver 1K uh, does have prohibited transaction rules. So they do apply to the Silver 1K like they do the IRA. But within the Silver 1K, if you make an investment that is a prohibited transaction, then only those funds involved in that transaction are penalized. So your whole account is not at risk. It's just those funds, and they're penalized 15%. So especially if you're self-directing your uh, solo 401k into investments, that might not be your typical standard of retirement type of investments. Um, like real estate, then I, I think this is another great advantage because there, sometimes you don't even realize that you might be mixed up in a prohibited transaction, and so just to not have that whole account be at risk is uh, very, very critical, I think. Um, there's some other benefits to Slow 401k. Those are just the kind of a quick overview. I think it, great advantages that at least hopefully have kind of gotten you interested in looking into a solo for one K. Um, but the, 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 a lot of people really like that you can contribute big funds to get your 401k started. But when I started out with my solo for one K, I was only a couple years into um, the business and I didn't have a lot of funds to go ahead and start putting towards retirement, but I really did want to make sure that I was investing aggressively and growing that account um, through the years. So one way that I want to show you all today is I started investing by lending. So lending to other real estate investors who might be fixing up and flipping houses or they were buying houses to rent out. But I didn't have all those funds to go and give somebody to do an entire real estate deal. So I have been doing something called wrap lending. So um, wrap before loan. Before we go on, um, Dorsey, before yes. we go on, we do have some questions. Um, and okay. then I also did want to mention, um, back to your point about um, having a bank account and being the trustee of your plan, um, I do want to mention at Avana IRA, we do allow that. Um, we have what we call a do-it-yourself 401k plan where you can be Great. the trustee and choose um, the bank where you want to hold that account. And we also can do it where we're directly um, involved as being your plan administrator. So you can do either with us. If you have more questions about that, please don't hesitate to give me a call. And we do have a question up here. Um, um, a, a participant wants to know, what do you use for your solo 401k bookkeeping? For my bookkeeping, I, I am very careful with my solo 401k bookkeeping, as everyone should be. Um, I like to use Quicken. Um, you can use QuickBooks. But what I do is when I'm, you know, keeping – account of the investments I make and all. I, there's ways on that um, software where you can tag and categorize it within the account what type of investments are made, if they're contributions or if you're loan payments. And um, so it's really a lot of it just kind of, kind of ties in with my own bookkeeping for my business. Um, I just keep it like in a separate account within the way I bookkeep all my other investments. Um, and you might have, Larissa, do you have any um, suggestions there with how to keep up um, with bookkeeping? Really, really, just as you mentioned, um, if, you're, if you're doing your own bookkeeping, you definitely want to make sure that you're keeping really good records. So having a program that can help you do that is going to be pretty important. Um, like as you mentioned, but I also I usually tell people too, they can always ask their accountant if they have any suggestions of that um, on what programs they can use for that. 
And, oh, and one other point, um, if you do have the Roth component within your account, it is absolutely crucial that you uh, make sure that you are um, identifying those Roth funds or the traditional funds. So if you're doing all your own bookkeeping, you really do need to make sure you're keeping track of all that. And that's something, so, so you said, Larissa, that you all do offer that as a service to your clients to be plan administrator? Yeah, we can either do um, the, the plan administrator um, or we can, you know, just do it, the do-it-yourself plan. So if we're the administrator, uh, any, any funds in and out of your IRA, that's going to be what we're record keeping. I mean, we could print a statement of your account in five minutes. It'll show all expenses paid, any income received. It'll note the property or the investment and um, what that expense was for. And so we're, we're really handling the record keeping on that end if we're acting as your plan administrator. When you go the do-it-yourself route, it obviously has its benefits, but you also want to make sure that you're keeping um, records just as we would. Okay. That's a great option. So if you are hesitant um, with setting this up and having full control, that's great that you all give them that option um, to handle that for them. Um, and I don't see any other questions at this time. I just want to remind everybody on the webinar, um, type your questions into the chat box. We're going to be taking questions um, after Dorsey goes over the example again. And, and I, I have a feeling you'll have more questions as we go forward. Um, and we'll move on to the example now. Okay. All right. So as I was saying, the, the RAP lending is really what I'm using to grow my solo for one pay aggressively. Um, and so what, what is a RAP loan? So a RAP loan, it's a loan that includes an underlying loan, and it profits on the RAP investment terms as well as the spread of the terms in regards to underlying loan. So you have a RAP loan, an underlying loan, you've got them both profiting on their own terms, but the RAP is profiting also on the spread. So it differs from a conventional second mortgage in that the wrap loan, the face amount overstates the actual indebtedness and states a special agreement between the borrower and the wrap lender for payment on the underlying loan. Okay, so this is a little confusing. And so I like to look at this um, kind of visually. And um, in this graph here, you can see that the wrap loan, um, on the next slide, over, you have a, yes, so you've got a wrap loan that has contributed small dollars into the entire deal, and then the underlying loan, which probably usually con, um, contributes the most funds into the deal. Um, but that underlying loan is going to have a specific interest rate, it's going to have specific payments, maybe there's some points on there. And then on top of that, the wrap loan comes in in second position, but it includes the dollar amount of the underlying loan plus the extra dollars that that wrap loan has contributed. And then that wrap loan itself is going to have a certain interest rate, certain payments, certain points. Um, and usually those terms are going to be higher than the underlying loan's terms. And so that's where you get the awesome returns for the RAP lender because they're going to be profiting on the spread of the terms for the dollars of the underlying loan. So some people look at this like maybe it's like a basketball, um, a circular underlying loan with a RAP loan going around it. So it's all being collateralized by one investment. There's one borrower, but within the RAP loan structure, there are two lenders, the underlying lender and then the wrapping lender, but they're both lending to one borrower with one deal. So real quick, um, the difference between the RAP loans and just your standard first and second mortgages um, is that a wrap loan, in a wrap loan, the wrap lender, he is an investor, not a borrower uh, or not a broker. So when I'm doing these wrap deals, I'm usually, I, I find someone who has a flip property or a rental property. I find someone who needs money to get a deal working. And then I find an investor who has the money but want to keep, get, wants to get their money working. So I'm putting them together, but I'm not brokering the deal because I myself am putting my own money in as the wrap lender. So I'm a principal in, in the transaction. Now, it could be confused as brokering if I did bring that underlying investor to the deal 
and I just went in second position because I have no um, – I have no um, control of that first. Um, I'm not involved in that first uh, position mortgage like I am when I'm wrapping the mortgage. Um, And I control that underlying loan because I have brought the lender into the deal saying, hey, here's, here's a good deal. I've done all my due diligence. I want to invest my funds in this deal. I think this would be a good investment for you, but you do, you know, you look over all the due diligence. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the borrower. Uh, I've already looked at it myself to see that I could invest in. Um, So I'm bringing some value there because uh, if there's construction draws or any, like, ongoing babysitting of the loan, I'm going to probably be doing that because I myself am an investor in the deal. Um, So in a regular first and second position type of structure, um, I could get foreclosed out by the first position um, investor, but in this case, it probably won't be the, the, the case because, I, the, because of the way that the deal has been created. Um, and so then with the wrap structure, the spread of the terms on the underlying loan profit are what gives me the excellent high returns, whereas if, I had just brought a lender into the deal and I'd gone behind them in second position, we both would just be profiting on our own respective terms. Um, The underlying lender is always profiting on the terms that they have required in the deal. Um, It's just with the wrap structure, it makes it more powerful for that wrap uh, wrap lender to um, be able to profit even more. So I want to show you first a short-term wrap loan example um, this, this is the really high, uh, the high returns that I'm excited, that I get really excited about. So this particular deal, this is a real life deal that uh, we've done, and um, I had a guy I knew from going to you know the local real estate meeting. Really, um, he had a flip property in my area, and he was looking for thirty thousand dollars. So I go out, look at the house take pictures, do my own due diligence, look at comparable sales, um, see if this is the type of investment I would do if I were him. So within that $30,000, he needed twenty six five dollars to purchase the property. It needed $7,000 in, in rehab, and he could sell it for $70,000. So I checked his numbers. I saw that I agreed with his numbers, and you can see he was going to come to the table with a couple grand to make the deal deal happen. So I was at under 50% loan to value at the end of the day. If, if I was only investing 30000 into it, a home that was going to be worth seventy grand, I felt like that was a good, safe investment. So problem was I wanted to get my solar for one K involved here and I didn't have thirty thousand to give him on this one deal. But I did know um, somebody who had private money and they had the thirty thousand get the deal done. Well, I said, Hey, if if you would lend on this particular deal, showing them the deal, um, saying it was a good deal, telling them all the numbers. Um, they agreed to lend $29,500, and this lender, he wanted 8% and two points for a six-month loan. So I put in the extra $500, and I put this deal together. So what it looked like at the closing table, the borrower, the guy with the, the house that was going to flip the house, um, he ended up signing these five documents. So he signed a security instrument to the underlying lender, and then the note to the underlying lender, and and the amount is going to be over the 29.5 because we do points financed in. So that's the two points financed in. So that note was a six-month note at 8% interest, two points financed in, and those payments were going to be $205 for the borrower. Then he also signed a security instrument to me as a wrap lender, and then the note to me um, in the amount of 31.5, and that's five points financed in at 15% interest for six months. And the payments to me were going to be 395. Well, then there was also an agreement between the borrower and I on how the, those payments are going to be made. Because the wrap loan includes the underlying loan, that 395 out of that 395 comes to 205. 
so when I set up my wrap loan, uh, my wrap loan structure, I tell my borrowers, okay, you pay, you pay the, the full amount, the three ninety five, and I, within five business days, will pay the underlying lender the two hundred five. So I will make sure that that is paid for them. And um, that's where that agreement at the closing table comes in. I promise that I will make those underlying payments when I receive the payment. So I'm not obligated to pay for the borrower to the underlying lender unless he pays me first. Okay? So um, when we go to closing, it ended up being, I think it ended up being a little less than six months. And so each month, on the interest, I was profiting $190. So my solar 401k account was growing $190 off of this investment every month. And then um, I also want to point out that when we are lending, especially to the, especially to somebody who wants a very short-term loan, um, in my area, 12 and 3 is a standard interest or standard terms. Um, 15 and 5 is what this particular borrower had agreed on with me. And so I always make sure I um, have a conversation with them ahead of time before closing so that when they get to closing, they realize that, okay, the funds are going to be coming from two, sep two parties, but um, I'm dealing with Dorsey on this deal. Um, and um, I always encourage them to talk to the attorney if they have any questions. So this particular deal, it turned out um, it sold for 71500 so it sold a little bit higher. Um, and you can see this on the next slide. The, the, um, the borrower ended up profiting, really nice little profit on this little house that didn't need that much work. So the underlying lender, oops, back, back to the last slide. Um, the underlying lender, he was happy because he netted um, a little over $1,000 on interest and $600 on points. So he was happy because he got that 8% and two points for his money being out. And then I profited, um, I profited over 2000 on my little $500 investment. And you can see this on the next slide. So I want to I wanna emphasize that that return, if you do this on your financial calculator, um, you can see the return is going to be like really like over 200% return there with a with a with your investment of $500, turning that into two grand. Um, so it's not a bad little deal if you can keep doing these types of deals um, over and over again. You can really grow your account and. You know, this was a 2013 deal in my area when home prices were 70 grand. Uh, right now, it's very hard to find deals like that, but um, the dollar amount, maybe instead of 500, you're doing a couple grand, and maybe it's a hundred thousand dollar house. So, um, just think about the way that you can kind of implement this structure into your market and um, grow your account. Um, but like I said, these short-term examples, you know, you've got to make sure your money keeps working. So once one deal is done, you might need to put it back out and keep doing a bunch of other deals. And that's where that 15% and five points, 15% uh, interest sounds great if you can keep it working. Um, but sometimes it's hard to keep those types of deals working constantly. So I want to show you a long-term wrap loan example where um, Kathy, you can you park your money. Yes. Um, we had a bunch of questions come in, so I want to address a few of those um, before we go on. So we had some questions okay. about the example, um, and then some um, questions popped up also about the solo K itself. Um, let's go okay. to the wrap questions first. Um, the first one I see here is, um, how do you guard against being foreclosed on um, by the first position? How do you guard against being foreclosed on? Well, if you're paying the first mortgage, then they can't foreclose, right? So when I, because I'm not obligated as a wrap lender to pay my underlying lender, if my borrower isn't paying me, then I'm going to have a talk with them. Either they're going to um, hand me back the house, um, give me title to the house and step away, or if they've left and, you know, just have stopped paying, 
then I will foreclose on the borrower. And in the meantime, I'm going to make sure that payments are made to my underlying lender because typically these underlying lenders are repeat business for me. And so I want to make sure that I keep them happy, um, especially since I have probably brought them into the deal in the first place. So, um, so even though I'm not obligated to pay them, I am going to pay them, and then I will step in and make sure that the deal is, is done and, pro and make sure that I profit. And because I'm lending just, you know, regular hard money lending rules here, um, when I'm lending, I want to lend be between 50 or below 65% loan to value. So if I ever did have to take back over the property, I can fix it up and resell it or just sell it as is to maybe another investor who can fix it up. I just want to make sure that I profit there more than if my borrower were to keep paying me. So um, that's just kind of a way to hedge that risk. So even though you're not obligated to the underlying lender, I would just keep paying them and um, I would step in myself so that I'm not foreclosed out. Okay. Um, another question um, came up. On the wrap, your borrower gets direct knowledge of the underlying lender. Um, so they see your spread. Couldn't they go directly to the underlying lender in the future? Yes, they could. Um, and that's why it's important to have the discussion ahead of time before the closing so that they're not surprised um, and they're not scared when they end up signing these, all the security instruments and the notes. Um, you do want to make sure they have knowledge that um, this is the bottom line. They agreed to the terms with you, so the 15 and 5. That's what they agree to. Um, and then I will call them up before closing and say, okay, um, you know, we're, we're going to make sure that you have those funds. I just want you to know the funds are going to be coming from a couple of sources. And um, the way that, you know, we stay in business is we, you know, we, we get the funds from other people who, who um, require less interest. But the 15 and 5 is, is what you said you could do on this, on this deal, right? And, you know, just make sure that they know that that's what they have agreed to. And if they go to closing and, yes, they see who the underlying lender is, yeah, they could, they could go around you the next time. But that's why you want to be in business with people who are going to treat you right and who want to keep working with you. Um, like I said, my, a lot of my underlying lenders are people that I keep doing business with. I keep borrowing from them, either myself or I wrap their funds and get their money working. So if they decide they're going to go, you know, going to take someone directly and cut me out the next time, then, then I probably won't do business with them again. But um, I also mentioned that the wrap lender usually provides some value to the deal, um, kind of babysits the deal and kind of, you know, maybe even blesses the deal at the beginning by saying, okay, you know, here's all the homework that I've done, you know, do your own homework, but here, here's a good deal I would do myself if I could. Um, so by providing that value, um, those underlying lenders who might not be very savvy investors to begin with, you know, you're giving them that peace of mind. Okay. Um, now, this next question um, really pertains to the plan itself. Can you set up a regular 401k for a business that has more employees and still invest in similar assets? So that would that would be just a regular 401k. Yeah, um, with a with it, a regular 401k and an employer's plan. Um, and, and I can answer that question, Dorsey, if you don't yeah. mind. Um, Go ahead. Basically, the answer to that question is yes, you can do it if you have um, a plan with employees. What you would have to do is have a third-party administrator that allows for a record-keeping portion. Um, with that, you would have the regular plan set up with all the testing that's involved, and you could move a portion of that 401k plan to advance the IRA in a record-keeping account and then make those alternative investments. Um, and okay. the next question we have is, um, can you roll the funds from a self-directed Roth IRA account into a self-directed 401k account and establish those funds as a Roth component of the 401k? Ooh, no, I'm afraid not. Not the Roth, not the Roth IRA, just the traditional. Okay, and that's it for questions for right now. Um, Dorsey has another example. Again, get your questions typed into the chat box, and we'll get to them in just a minute here. Okay, so I just wanted to show you um, the this, this same type of example. Um, this, this is going to be like a longer-term loan. 
um, just kind of hammer this type of structure home to you guys. Um, so also with, like, investing for retirement accounts, because um, I have a ways to go until I retire, um, sometimes I kind of want to put my savings um, in investments that might be a little bit out of sight, out of mind, just so that um, – in good, solid investments so that they can just kind of keep growing. And as I make more contributions or um, I have more funds to invest with, I can keep investing in new deals. Um, so I, I like to diversify with long-term deals and short-term deals. Um, so this is a long-term wrap loan example from a friend um, nearby. And he had a rental property he was looking at, and it had two houses on the the piece of land that he was looking at. Um, he was wanting 55000 and that would be for a $45,000 purchase and probably about $10,000 um, in rehab on these two properties. So not, not a bad rehab. Um, it was like a brick ranch, and then there's this little other little cottage thing on the property as well. Um, so figured that after repair value, once he fixed up these properties, Properties would be worth about $105,000. Uh, um, it wasn't as important to him as that was to me because when I'm making the loan, I want to make sure, again, that my loan-to-value is a low loan-to-value. So if the property, um, when it was fixed up, was worth over hundred grand, that would that made that $55,000 loan look very attractive. Um, but he wanted to keep this as a long-term rental. Um, and so for the 55 grand, I had a lender who wanted 6%. Um, they said if they could just get their money working for a long term, 6% um, was going to be better than the 1% they were getting in CDs at the bank. Uh, so they put up the 53,000 in first position as the underlying lender at 6%. And then I contributed 2,000. Um, and wraps that underlying loan. So um, what this deal looked like, the structure of this deal, there was, again, a security instrument from that borrower to the underlying lender, and then the note, which in this particular note, um, I ended up giving, uh, the underlying lender ended up taking 6.5% uh, interest, and they didn't ask for any points. They just wanted the interest, and so they agreed to have their money out for a total of 180 months um, for the term of that loan. And so payments work out to be 470, and that's going to be um, amortized over those 180 months. Uh, then the borrower signed a security instrument and also a note to me as a wrap lender. So that's in that 56701 um, that's going to be the points financed in, that's three points that he agreed to. Um, he pays 8% interest, and that's, again, 180 months. And so total payments from him are 550 a month. Again, I turn around and I pay the 470 a month. So I'm only receiving $80 a month on this one particular deal. I put two grand in, um, but I'm getting $80 a month for 15 years. And then I'm also getting three points at the end, um, you know, in the whole, the whole deal, I'm getting those three points on the whole 56-7. And so if you were to work that out, that's a 48% return for my solo 401k. So not a bad little deal. I mean, $80 every month, it's not a lot of money. But if you can keep doing these types of deals and – um, really spread out your investments. That's one thing I like about the wraps. Um, you might have a lot of money to invest in, uh, to invest with, but if you can do more deals across the board, that, then you've also diversified your risk and you can grow that account with many investments, um, especially if you're doing long-term investments where you don't have a lot of work to put in to managing those funds. Um, it's a really, really great way to grow your account aggressively. Um, and so those are two wrap loan examples. It's, a, it's a, kind of a complex structure, but if you um, are into lending, which I, I, like to I like to lend with my retirement um, accounts, I like to hold notes in them, because there's very low liability 
um, you know, someone, a tenant's not going to trip and fall and sue my solo 401k um, because I have a note and that kind of, that has less liability than maybe the property itself being within my solo 401k. So if you want to learn more about um, wrap loans, um, you can go to assets101.com. We have a class every spring. Um, my father teaches with an attorney um, about hard money lending. Um, it, but also, if you want to know more about Sofa 1K, uh, you can find my book there as well. And um, kind of gives you a rundown of all the advantages of what you can do with a Sofa 1K. We give a few examples. Um, I talk a little bit about the wraps. But um, really to learn how to lend um, and get the documents and everything, that the class next spring um, that you can find on the website is the way to go. Um, so I, I can take some questions, but I just want to say good luck with your investments. I really hope that you all are interested in opening up a solar 401k with Advana because um, it's just a great little tool, another, another way to, another vehicle to invest with. Um, and we you know, prepare for retirement. Uh, we did have a question come up here. Is the term okay. underlying lender interchangeable with hard money lender? If not, how does one find an underlying lender? Okay, so I, I just called them the underlying lender because they're the ones that are under the wrap lender. So it's, it's private money. It might be a private money lender. It might be a hard money lender. Um, sometimes people think of hard money lenders as um, – lenders who um, lend with higher rates because they might be in the business of lending or they're lending a lot to um, borrowers doing many deals. Um, private lending might be a little softer term, um, but it could also just be a civilian. It could be um, someone you know who is not happy getting 1% or 0.1% at the bank. Um, you know, it, I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't turn to friends and family <laughs> from the get-go, um, but once you start building that credibility and that trust among people, there's a lot of people out there who are unhappy with getting the returns that they're getting in other investments. And so if you can show them um, some successful deals, um, show them you know, that, that their funds are being collateralized by a good property, then um, you'd be surprised the number of people that are really wanting to start investing in real estate, and this is just one way how you can get them started. Um, another question came up. Uh, for the closing, does one uh, need a special type of closing attorney, and how do they find one? Oh, um, when I was tr looking for closing attorneys, I would go to, like, my local real estate group. I'd ask around to other real estate investors, um, ask around to uh, – good real estate agents in the area who the, they like working with. Um, but yes, you do want to talk with the attorney or whoever's handling the closing. Make sure that they understand the RAP loan structure. Um, there's, uh, there's some stories out there about people closing RAP uh, loans and um, ended up cutting checks for the full amount of the RAP loan and then the full amount of the underlying loan. So, which is a lot more, you know, if, if, it's, if the wrap loan includes the underlying loan, but you're still cutting the check for the full amount and then the full amount for the underlying loan, then that's a, that's a big problem there. Um, so you do want to make sure that whoever's handling the closings that they understand. Um, and, and just by asking around, uh, people will, you know, give you suggestions and recommendations. Um, yeah, and, and I want to mention, if you're looking for, if you're not a member of a local real estate club and you're not sure how to find them, you can always check out our website, um, advanaira.com. Go to the events tab. If we are um, affiliate members or if we attend those meetings, because we do a lot of networking, some of those meetings are listed on our website, so you can check that out. Um, and also, you can ask around to local investors and find out where they network as well. Um, I had another question come up. Are you in the Atlanta area, and what are the normal rates for hard uh, lender or honey, hard money loans and the full purchase and rehab amount? Ooh, um, yes, but it really depends, and it it really depends case by case, deal by deal, who you're working with. Um, 
I mean, I, I borrow money myself because I'm flipping and I have rental properties that I'm dealing with. And so um, the terms, I don't see terms as important as I do uh, the people I'm working with and the documents that are there and how quick I can get the money. Uh, 15% and five points, it might be right now, it might be on the higher end of the terms that you'd be paying for a short-term deal, but if those funds are there within three business days or, you know, your lender can act really quick, then that's just an extra value added to that type of product that they're giving you. Um, so um, 12 and 3 to 15 and 5 is typical for flip properties or for short-term deals. Um, and also think about this, like those lenders are putting the money out for maybe – three, four, six months, um, not the whole year, but they're, they're having to do more work to get that money out. And so 15% at the end of the day, if you're looking to flip the property, it's not that much um, if you are actively fixing it up and have it on the market and being aggressive with flipping it. Um, but right now with the way interest rates are so low at the bank, um, longer term uh, money that you can find out there is a lot lower than we've ever seen. Um, but again, it just case by case, deal by deal. Okay. Um, another question, uh, uh, refi LTV 60%, term three to five years, 30 year amortized, what is reasonable, what are reasonable points and rates? Again, I mean, I, it, when, when we're evaluating a deal, it just, it depends. Um, I hate to kind of put <laughs> to, to throw some numbers out there um, because it, it really just depends. And it depends on if you are planning on wrapping funds, um, who are those investors or the lenders that you're going to look to, you know, who has the money that's going to be the underlying lender in your structure and what are they requiring? Because if they are saying, nope, I have to have at least 9 or 10 percent, then, you know, that's going to dictate how you talk with the borrower um, if you know that those that the funds that you have access to are going to be a little higher rate. So by talking and kind of seeing what people are willing to pay or what they're requiring, um, that's going to kind of dictate how you um, proceed in that. Um, and I also want to mention, like, even if, you know, if someone – is willing to lend at maybe 12%, and you know the borrower won't pay any, uh, or won't pay um, more than 12% themselves. And maybe you can talk to underlying lender and say, "Hey, will you take 11 and a half?" Because even that half percentage, if you're getting that spread on the funds of the underlying loan, it just makes your loan even, it makes your return even higher. Um, so don't discredit if you know if the spread is not going to be you know, a couple percentage points or a couple points, don't worry. Even the littlest bit can help grow your account. Um, that's great. And, and I want to mention, too, um, we're, we're wrapping it up here. It, you know, type your questions into the chat box. Let's get them in so we can get, them, get your questions answered. And while we're waiting um, to make sure there's no other questions, I have one of my own. Um, what due diligence or homework do you do on the borrower? Um, you mentioned taking photos, checking out the property. What, what about the borrower? Yeah, just talking with them. I like, if this is someone I've never worked with, I want to see some of their previous deals. I want to see uh, some of their success stories. Um, or if they're a landlord, then, you know, I want to go and visit the properties. And um, I want to see all their numbers. Um, you know, ask them what their spreads are because I want to make sure that they're happy and they're profiting themselves and that they're not spreading themselves too thin on deals because, um, you know, I want to make sure that they're successful so that we can continue to do um, business together. Um, and that's where, you know, if just being a lender, being like, you know, learning all the hard money rules, just all the due diligence, comps, um, don't necessarily you know need to go out and pull credit on somebody but you do want to kind of know what the reputation is around town and that's where you know if it's someone you meet at aria you know talking with other people who might have dealt with them um just you know it, it it's kind of like you're you know getting a business partner so really want to make sure that you are compatible and can work together even though it's kind of hands-off when you're the lender um after the loan is made 
um, that you do want to have a friendly relationship with them and make sure that they're paying and uh, make sure you can be there to help them out if they need. Okay. Well, at this time, I don't see any other questions, and I want to thank Dorsey so much for um, accepting our invitation to join us for this webinar. If you have any questions for Dorsey or if you have any questions for me, then uh, send me an email. I'll get your questions over to Dorsey. Um, you can always check out our website at www.advantaira.com. We always have educational events going on, so again, clicking on the Events tab, see what we have coming up. Um, we have Lunch and Learns every other week at um, our, both our Atlanta office and our Largo, Florida office, as well as webinars, um, usually at least twice a month. So we already have our September calendar up there. Um, and Dorsey, do you want to go ahead and give your website again? Yeah, it's www.assets101.com. And we're going to be putting our 2017 schedule up there in a few days. Um, but we also have a cruise next February. Um, for those of you all who are local to Tampa, uh, Peter Fortunato, who's an investor down there, he's going to be on the cruise with us next February, but we're booking up fast. So you can find all the information there. Okay. We'd love to have you all. Thank you so much, Dorothy, and thank you, everybody, who thank logged you. on for the webinar. Yes, thanks for listening. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you.